So the other group of vertebrates besides the cyclostomes, the circle mouths, is the nathostomes. So nathos means uh, jaw, and then stoma is mouth. So these are going to be groups that have a true top and bottom jaw that you open and close to eat food. So these are typically hinged, meaning that they're gonna open kind of like a door hinge to allow food in and then close to allow for food processing. Um, we're typically gonna see teeth here for capturing as well as uh, slicing up food items. The most prominent hypothesis is that these came from a modification of the gill slits. So these would have been part of the pharyngeal gill slits, which is one of those four characteristics of chordates. So you can see you can see these skeletal structures here that support the gills, and it was likely that there was another one here, but this one moved forward and became larger to allow for processing of food. And this is a huge advantage because this is going to allow for associations of this head region with feeding, which means that we're going to start to see things like enlarged brains, enhanced senses, um, enhanced predator abilities um, with having an actual jaw. Um, inside of the nathostomes, we start to see what's called a lateral line system. So this is another uh, common characteristic. And so this usually runs along the side of the fish and it's gonna have organs that are sensitive to vibration. So this is something that is prominent in sharks and other fishes, and this is how they can sense where each other are and then even where prey items might be in the water column without having to see or smell them, but they might just be able to physically feel them. And there were some precursors to these sensors in the heads of the non-jawed vertebrates, but they didn't have a full-on lateral line system. So we have fossil nathostomes that do not exist anymore today. So both of these are extinct. And this happened about 440 million years ago. And this is when we start to see the really the radiation of predators. And there are a lot more jawed vertebrates, nathostomes, than there are non-jawed vertebrates. So there were only about 60 or so species of the cyclostomes. We're going to have tons of jawed vertebrates because this is a huge advantage. Um, this is a combination of features that leads to success. We're typically going to see they have paired fins. So those paired fins are going to be able to allow them to move up and down and side to side in the water column, um, as well as the stiff fin up here for orienting um, so they don't roll. We see, uh, along with steering control, the ability to orient food into this very dangerous mouth is going to make for a pretty strong predator. Uh, so some of these early groups were actually very armored. So these are actually bony. Um, and these are called placoderms. So placo means uh, plate. And derm means skin. So these means plate skin. So that's these guys. And they had these heavy armor plates all the way kind of halfway over their body. Um, so these are the placoderms, or at least this is what we think um, a placoderm might have looked like. The bony processes actually preserve fairly well in fossils because they're so hard. And most of these were less than a meter, but we do think that there were some really, really large ones that might have grown to be a, as large as 10 meters long. And then there was also the acanthodians. So that would be uh, artist rendition of an acanthodian here. And so this doesn't have big bony plates on it, um, but it, it did was one of the first vertebrates to have a jaw. And we can see it kind of has scales that might be more like what you would expect to see in a bony fish nowadays. And this time, 440 million years ago, was really tumultuous for evolutionary change. So we don't know exactly how the lineages break out from these fossil nathosomes to the current day jawed vertebrates. So again, both of these are extinct. So nowadays we have three main groups. We have the chondriichthys, which are the sharks and skates and rays that have a skeleton made of cartilage. And then we have the ray fin fishes, which have a bony skeleton and bony rays. Uh, in their fins. 
And then we have the lobe fin fishes, which also have a bony skeleton, but they have a fleshy, muscular um, fins that are going to start to kind of look like limbs. So the first group we'll look at is the chondryichthys. So these are going to include sharks and rays, and their relatives are going to include other flat species that are called skates, as well as these ratfish, which are called chimeras. So this name, chondries, means cartilage, and ichthus means fish. So their clade name literally means cartilage fish. And this is a derived characteristic, right? Um, so the previous group of extinct bony vertebrates, the placoderms, the acanthodians, those had bony skeletons. So the development of chondriacthes, so the bone developed back here, and then the development of cartilage over here is a advantage. Um, it actually gives them a lot of flexibility. There are traces of bone found inside of sharks, so at the very base of the scales and at the very base of the teeth, which we actually think the teeth developed from the scales, uh, there are pieces of bone. So when people say that sharks don't have any bone, that's not actually true. They do have teeny tiny bits of bone um, at the base of the scales and teeth. So there's about a thousand species of chondriacthes total. Somewhere over 400 of those are sharks. Um, so sharks are gonna be extremely uh, streamlined for the most part. And the, they have uh, several fins. So these pectoral fins in the front are for uh, maneuvering for up and down. Uh, the dorsal fins are going to help for them to stabilize to prevent kind of that rolling side to side. Pelvic fins are often modified into reproductive structures. Um, sharks do not have a swim bladder, unlike other fish, and so they can't fill their little swim bladder with air to, to float. Um, so what they have is they actually have a really big liver, which is full of oil. And if you've ever put oil in water, you know that oil floats, and that's going to help them keep buoyant. Um, they typically swim continuously to help water flow over their gills. However, there have been shown to be species of sharks that are capable of sitting flat on the, um, the sediment and pumping water over their gills. So again, um, the statement that all sharks have to swim to be able to breathe, again, not true. There are species of sharks that literally sit in caves and just pump water over their gills. The largest shark is the whale shark, and it is a suspension feeder. So it's actually going to eat really, really tiny krill and uh, little tiny fish out of the water column. And it does this because that's actually a more economical method of getting energy. Because when you eat really high up in the food chain, you're not getting a lot of the relative energy. But by eating tons and tons of krill, the whale shark is actually getting more energy. So that's why some of these really big organisms eat really, really tiny stuff. Um, sharks have tons of rows of teeth, so they're constantly being replaced. At any one time, you could probably see four or five rows of teeth. Um, and they're always being gradually lost as they're damaged or, um, you know, bite into something and <laughs> don't come back with the food. Um, inside of their digestive system, they have kind of just a short intestine. And to create more surface area for digestion, they have a really cool spiral mechanism inside of their digestion called the spiral valve that gives them more room for digesting their food. They have very sharp vision, but it's not color, um, and as well as very good smell. And then along the bottom of the head, and then all along the line of the body, they have a structure called the ampullae of Lorenzini, which are capable of detecting vibrations in the water. So they can tell where other fish are, even if they're buried and they can't see or smell them. Um, sharks are all internal fertilization, so a male shark will have a structure here called a clasper, um, and those are paired, they, but they only use one at a time, and they will insert those into the female. It's not a true copulatory organ like a penis, um, it's more like just a groove to transfer sperm to the female, um, rather than kind of like a penis that has a urethra enclosed inside of a copulatory structure. Uh, Sharks can produce eggs in literally every possible um, fashion. So they can be oviparous, which means that they lay an egg and it hatches outside of the mother, never even sees the mother. 
They can be ovoviviparous, means that they make an egg, the egg stays in the female uterus, hatches in the uterus, and then the young is born, but it's not connected via any kind of placenta. And then they can produce viviparous young, which is very similar to what we do, um, where the embryo develops in the uterus, it's nourished through not a placental connection to the mother, but a yolk sac, um, and there's no actual egg that surrounds it. Um, and so each species does this a specific way, but it's really kind of cool that this entire clade has developed all three different ways of reproducing. Um, skates and rays down here are dorsoventrally flattened. They're going to typically live along the bottom. Um, the mouth is not here at the front. The mouth is actually on the underside, and their, their teeth are developed into these hard, flat plates for crushing. Um, and then these side are the actual, the pectoral fins, are enlarged, and they use those for propulsion, unlike the shark who's going to use the caudal or tail fin for propulsion. Um, some of these do have venomous barbs, so the barbs can be here at the base of the tail or sometimes even further out on the tail, uh, depending on the species, and uh, they can use those to whip around and catch prey or to protect themselves from predators.